the best way to learn a language? Immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Hi, this is Rob Benedict. And I am Richard Spate. We were both on a little show you might know called Supernatural. It had a pretty good run. 15 seasons, 327 episodes. And though we have seen, of course, every episode many times, we figured, hey, now that we're wrapped, let's watch it all again. And we can't do that alone. So we're inviting the cast and crew that made the show along for the ride. We've got writers, producers, composers, directors, and we'll of course have some actors on as well, including some certain guys that played some certain pretty iconic brothers. It was kind of a little bit of a left field choice in the best way possible. The note from Kripke was, he's great, we love him, but we're looking for like a really intelligent Duchovny type. With 15 seasons to explore, it's going to be the road trip of several lifetimes. So please join us and subscribe to Supernatural then and now. Hello and welcome to the Vulgar History Podcast. My name is... Anne Foster, and this is a feminist women's history comedy podcast to get our minds off of the literal hellscape in which we are all living today. Let's look back at what things were like in the 16th century in England when it was also pretty grisly, but at least we're not living in it. This is season three. And what we've been looking at is the season-long topic of how to lose a queen in nine days, a.k.a. the Lady Jane Grey scenario. And we're getting closer and closer to that. We've looked at her grandmother, her step-grandmother, some other women who are influential to her. And this week we are going to look at her mother, a woman whose name is... Well, she was born Lady Frances Brandon, and then she got married and became Frances Grey, Duchess of Suffolk. And that's who we're going to be looking at today. So cast your mind back. So Lady Frances Brandon. So she's the daughter of Mary Tudor, who we talked about in the first episode of this podcast, who was Mary Tudor was the sister of Henry VIII. And Frances was her oldest surviving child. Her father was Charles Brandon, the king's BFF. So Frances, she was born on July 16th, 1517. And she was named Frances because her birth date was St. Francis's Day, the day we celebrate St. Francis. That's sort of a guess. Her name could have also been a nod to King Francis I of, in France because both of his parents knew him 
It may have wanted to pay respects to him. Her mother was, of course, the Dowager Queen of France. Her godmothers were Catherine of Aragon, who was still the queen at this point, and Princess Mary. So Princess Mary, the daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. So she's, because she's the king's niece, so of course she's way up there. Of course she has very societally important godparents. Frances had a brother, Henry, who is one year older than her, and a sister, Eleanor, who is two years younger. She also had two older half-sisters from her father's first marriage, who were named Mary and Anne, who were both five to ten years older than her. Frances grew up in the countryside of Suffolk, in the village of Westthorpe, in so her parents had numerous different homes because they were rich and had lots of homes and but the one where Frances grew up was their favorite one which is called Westhorpe Hall she's again this is the same time period so Princess Mary is a girl Catherine of Aragon is a queen and this is an era in which girls were given much more access to a thorough education than they had been in the past in England so she's given an education suitable for a woman of her rank it sort of spoke to how rich and classy your parents were, to see how how well educated your daughters were. In 1528, so when she was 11 years old, her father purchased the wardship of the wealthy heiress Catherine Willoughby, who we talked about a few episodes ago. Catherine was about two years older than Francis, so Francis. Let me just see. Francis was 11 at this point, so Catherine would have been about two years older. So Catherine joined the household as sort of uh, effectively an adopted sister. So she grew up alongside Francis and Eleanor, as well as their brother Henry. And everyone assumed that Catherine Willoughby was going to be wed, married to Henry, eventually. This is what's going on, just suddenly a whole bunch of siblings in this house. Both of Francis's parents had been famously good-looking, and Francis apparently was as well, although we don't super know what she looked like, other than the way that the carving is on her tomb but she was probably good looking and she was known as the lady Frances. she wasn't technically a princess but because her mother was the dowager queen of france and she was the king's niece so she was treated similarly to a princess even though she technically wasn't didn't have the title of princess when Frances was 15 years old she was betrothed to henry gray the third marquess of dorset who I just want to mention was six months older than her. It's just sort of a treat at this point. This is how low my standards are for relationships in any of the stories this season, that he's not 60 years older than her. So they're about the same age, her and Henry. They were sort of step cousins. Both of them were descendants of Elizabeth Woodville. So Elizabeth Woodville, Henry VIII's grandmother, Elizabeth Woodville had had a first husband who was Mr. Gray and then she had some gray children and then she married Edward and then the Henry VIII and the Tudors were her other family stream so basically this was just a good match of two people who are pretty equal in most ways so usually for non-royal non-rich people you had to wait legally until the bride was 20 years old to marry but these two were not commoners and so exceptions were allowed to be made Henry's her husband His grandfather was the half-brother of Henry VIII's grandmother. So politically, this was an advantageous match because there were still some hard feelings between Henry VIII and his sister, Mary, who you might recall from that episode, didn't approve of him marrying Anne Boleyn, which was happening at the same time. So the Brandon family in general, the children of Mary Tudor, and Charles Brandon and their children, the Brandon family, were sort of on the outs with the king, but a marriage between Francis Brandon and Henry Gray would potentially, they were all hoping, smooth things over and make the Brandons be welcome back into royal favor. Yeah, so in 1528, Charles Brandon bought the wardship of Catherine Willoughby, and then a few years later in 1533, is this the same year they got married? Uh, Yeah, so the same year they got married at around the same time, Charles Brandon purchased the wardship without the estates of Henry Gray for 4,000 marks. So this is just some backstory of how he was able to arrange the marriage because he became Henry Gray's guardian as well. He was able to choose who Henry Gray would marry. And he was like, what about my daughter? So Henry Gray had originally been betrothed to a woman named Catherine Fitzallen, but Henry Gray 
refused to go through the marriage because he had his sight set higher. So bear that in mind. Henry Gray, Francis's husband, was an ambitious person. And the thing is that a marriage to Francis Brandon had much more prestige because she was the king's niece. So he reneged on the marriage to Catherine Fitzellen by paying a fee. Uh, the king paid the first installment on the debt. So clearly the king was in favor of this match. So at their wedding, King Henry VIII attended the wedding, which was probably that May, May of 1533, at Suffolk Place. For whatever reason, we know the detail that this wedding cost Charles Brandon about 1,666 pounds at the time, which is just like, I didn't do the conversion, but when you bear in mind that $50 or $10 was like 5,000, so this was just like a hugely expensive wedding. So shortly after this wedding, Anne Boleyn was crowned queen, and Catherine of Aragon, Francis's godmother, was demoted to dowager princess. Francis and her mother did not like Anne Boleyn, and so they did not attend this coronation. And then Francis's mother lived long enough to see Francis's wedding, but then she died on June 25th. That's Mary Tudor. And Francis, as the oldest daughter, acted as chief mourner at her funeral. A few months after this, after Mary Tudor's death, Francis's father, Charles Brandon, married Catherine Willoughby, his ward. So that's the whole gross situation we got into a while ago. Weird, strange, but apparently they also got along. So, okay. That September, 1533, just being a very busy year, was when Anne Boleyn gave birth to a daughter who became Princess Elizabeth. Just stuff is happening super quickly here. It was, must have felt so chaotic to live in. None of us would know what that's like to live in a time of absolute chaos. In March 1534, Princess Mary, who was also Francis's godmother, was omitted from the succession by Parliament, and then also Francis's brother Henry died. So what this meant is that Elizabeth, at this point, was next in line to the throne, and Francis was next, effectively. Uh, in 1536, Catherine of Aragon died. Anne Boleyn was beheaded. Like, stuff is just coming fast and furious. And Henry VIII's daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, were both declared illegitimate and barred from the throne by law of parliament. So when you set aside Henry, his older sister was Margaret Tudor. And she had children, and she, but she had been married off to the King of Scotland, so her children were Scottish and also Catholic, so Henry kind of wasn't counting them. So at this point... With the disinheriting of Elizabeth and Mary, Francis just kind of moved up higher in the overall scheme of things. So in documents and state reports, Francis is listed just behind the king's daughters. So she's super important person. And four years later, Francis gave birth to her first surviving child, a daughter who they named Lady Jane Grey. She had previously lost a son in infancy about a year before, who had been named Henry. But Lady Jane Grey was her first surviving child. That name might be familiar to you from the theme of this whole season, so Lady Jane Grey is on the scene. She was named after the Queen, who at this point was Jane Seymour, and Jane Seymour was named as Lady Jane Grey's godmother. So again, Francis and her family being super tight with, with the King. This was at exactly the same time that the Pilgrimage of Grace had just ended. So this was the year-long rebellion of people from Northern England who supported uh, the Catholic religion. They were mad at Henry. Um, they were sort of running around, making their point politically through riots and demonstrations. And so at the point that Lady Jane Grey was born, London Bridge was decorated with the decapitated heads of the rebellion leaders because the Pilgrimage of Grace had just ended with Henry defeating them. So this just kind of set the tone for what the whole world was like. Overall in that situation, 144 rebels had been dismembered and their body parts put on show both in the north of England, where they had, where most of the rebellions had started, and also around London. So things are just, I'm putting in all these details just so you can sort of picture the utter chaos and weird terror of just what the world was like. But Frances was mostly, she was good with the king, like her daughter's godmother was the queen. Frances was in a good situation, despite all the chaos everywhere. Uh, that October, 
Jane Seymour, the queen, gave birth to Henry VIII's only legitimate son, Prince Edward. So as soon as he was born, this diminished Francis's position because this baby was now the new heir. I guess Francis would be next behind him. And Francis, as the next in line, attended the prince's christening. And then weeks later, Jane Seymour died and Francis was in the funeral procession for her. At the funeral procession, Francis was second in line behind Princess Mary, her own godmother. In 1538, like things are just... She got married in 1533, and then by 1538, everything's just chaotic. She's just 20 years old at this point, Francis. In 1538, the same year, Henry Gray, her husband, turned 21, which meant he was able to get access to his money, and so the couple finally had financial independence and were able to move into their own home. They were a very sociable couple. They entertained lots of visitors. Apparently, they enjoyed this like 20 and 21-year-old young family with a daughter. They enjoyed gambling, playing cards, and dice. Francis apparently, like everybody did, I mean, rich everybody. She enjoyed going hunting. Um, She enjoyed hawking, like going out with her hawks, doing whatever. For New Year's 1540, Francis received a gift of, of hounds from Henry VIII. Occasionally, Francis and her husband would attend royal court, but for the most part, they stayed in the country. And this is, like, remember that Edward had been born, so even though Francis was next in line, when it also just seemed like, well, Henry's probably going to have more children, or if not, he has a son. So Francis, even though she was next in line, it wasn't, no one really thought anything was going to come of it. So she was able to just be sort of a very rich, royal adjacent person. She attended the wedding of Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves, which was his next wife. However, Francis and Henry's lavish lifestyle led to financial difficulties, and they were constantly in debt. In 1540, Francis gave birth, probably, again, people's birth dates weren't written down very reliably, but around then, she gave birth in probably August of 1540 to her second daughter, Lady Catherine Grey, and then five years later, she had a third daughter, Lady Mary Grey. So they had three daughters, no living sons. Francis and Henry were very aware of their royal status, and they knew that their three daughters had really high status as well, and so they harbored high ambitions for them, especially for Jane, who was the eldest, and seemingly kind of the smartest. So they really thought that maybe good things could happen for her, powerful, important things. Again, so just like Francis had been given this really good education, the three girls were all given an education trendily grounded in humanism. They hired lots of tutors. Francis and Henry were Protestants, and so they raised their daughters as evangelicals, and we got all into that in the last episode. But So the religion becomes really important, especially when we're looking at Jane Grey's whole situation. So they invested much of their time and money, like buying, getting the best tutors, you know, the best musical instruments and stuff for Jane, who was their oldest. And also seemingly kind of the, the most likely to succeed of the three. Catherine was kind of like a, if we're looking at them in terms of little women slash Pride and Prejudice, Jane was very much like the Lizzie Bennet and slash Joe March. Like she was just the really smart one who you knew was sort of destined for great things. Catherine, the middle daughter, was sort of like a Lydia Bennet slash Amy March. And then Mary Gray was sort of like a Meg slash Jane, just sort of like nice and quiet. So it I don't know how much of that is self-fulfilling that they put so much of their energy into making Jane be as amazing as possible, but she also kind of had the most potential, and she was the oldest, so that made sense. In the summer of 1543, Henry VIII married his sixth wife, Catherine Parr, who we talked about last time. Francis was friends with Catherine. Yes, she was part of, or sort of like a adjacent member at large of the Renaissance Reformation Girl Squad. So Frances served Catherine Parr in her privy chamber in 1546. Um, At around the same time, Bess of Hardwick, who's sort of a famous, notable, rich woman in this era, joined Frances's household as a waiting gentlewoman. So that's, I mean, not like a super important plot point, but just bear that in mind for stuff that happens later on. So this was to be the beginning of a long-lasting friendship between Bess of Hardwick, who was also really resilient, really uh, ambitious, and Francis. So Bess may... She had several husbands as well. 
I mean, I'm not doing a podcast episode about Bess of Hardwick this season. I'm sure I will at some point. And I wrote an essay about her on my website, but she had several different husbands. One of, so she may have met her second husband when she was serving in the Gray household. So the Grays hosted Bess of Hardwick and William Cavendish. That's her second husband. The Grays hosted their wedding at Bradgate in 1547, which was followed by two days of celebration. So Frances was just kind of like the go-to gal for like social events of the season. So things are just like whipping around. Things are happening. Things are changing. And one of the things that was changing is Henry VIII was getting more and more sick and he was changing his will. His final act of succession. You know what? I'm not going to get into all of it. But Francis was just sort of like ping-ponging around of like you're next in line like oh no the girls are actually not illegitimate anymore like oh no yeah no you're next in line oh no the girls are illegitimate again but the main thing was that edward was his heir and it's just kind of like who would be after him would it be francis or would it be mary and elizabeth her father charles brandon died on august 22nd 1545 francis was by his side so we see a lot of that in these stories or especially in her story just family members being there when people die which just it's a nice thing. In his will, Charles Brand and her father had left Francis and her sister Eleanor each 200 pounds worth of plate. I regret to inform you, I did not look that up, but I'm sure that's something cool. Along with jewelry and household items. So the stuff that they inherited, Francis would have inherited, is equal to about 61,000 pounds in today's money, which is about twice that of dollars. Although, at the time of Charles Brandon's death, he still had two surviving sons who stood to inherit his dukedom. So, Francis and Eleanor, this is his thing. Like, she wasn't really his heir. She wasn't really the heir to the king. Just a whole bunch of men are going to die. I just feel like Tudor men were just real fragile at this time. So, when Francis was serving as the Lady of the Privy Chamber to Catherine Parr, she would sometimes bring Jane to court with her sometimes to prepare Jane for her future life as a maid of honor serving the queen which was just what everyone assumed Jane's life was going to the next step of her life would be, probably. So Catherine Parr, who you all know about from the last episode, was a passionate evangelical who supported the new Reformed religion, as did Francis's stepmother, Catherine Willoughby. This So 1546, this is the same year that Anne Askew, who we also talked about last time, had been arrested for street preaching after yelling at her husband publicly and leaving him a.k.a. she was great, if you haven't listened to the last episode. So Anne Askew was sentenced to death for heresy, but rumor had it that the Queen and her inner circle, the Renaissance Reformation Girl Squad, secretly supported her both like financially, but also just philosophically. Allegedly, before she was arrested, Anne had been introduced to both Francis and Eleanor, who were the King's nieces, so really important rich people for her to meet, like good financial patrons for her. If this did happen, if Anne Askew had met Francis and Eleanor, it's probably through an introduction from Catherine Willoughby, because, well, that's the connection between the Greys and the king at this point. By the end of 1546, King Henry was dying. And again, he kept, like, changing his will. His whole thing was just wanting to make sure that the succession was obvious and clear and the Tudors would be in control forever, which I think we all know they were not. So he reiterated in his will that his three surviving children should inherit the throne. So go like Edward, and then Mary, and then Elizabeth. So boy, and then the girls in age order. He officially skipped over his older sister, Margaret, and her heirs, saying that after his three children, next in order would be the issue of Francis herself. So Francis herself was not the heir, which is interesting. Why did he exclude her? chances are it was because her husband Henry Gray was sort of a Henry didn't care for him he didn't trust him and the way that everybody understood that being a queen would work England had not had a queen at this point the closest they had come before this was Empress Matilda which didn't work out but just the way that the laws worked and everything if the queen had a husband then the husband would effectively be in charge and Henry didn't want Henry Gray to be in charge So, but Francis's children were not yet married, so maybe, anyway, it's just less scary, but who thought that all of Henry's children would not 
inherit. So this is just all sort of like a technicality at this point. And then, so Henry died, and then surprising everyone, Catherine Parr got married super quickly to Thomas Seymour, the brother of Jane Seymour, just four months after the king died. And we got into that last time. It was a terrible decision on her part. She was in love, I guess. He was awful. Uh, Thomas approached Francis and Henry with a proposal to marry their daughter Jane to King Edward, the boy king, who was Thomas's nephew. So he kind of did have the power to maybe arrange that. He offered them a loan of 2,000 pounds for this. And in return, he asked that Jane be sent to live with him and his new wife, Catherine Parr. So they agreed to this, obviously, because having their daughter married to the king meant that she would be the queen, and that's amazing. And also, I'm sure they could use the 2,000 pounds. And so some people, some historians, look at this decision as being showing that Francis and her husband were, like, power-hungry or scheming or whatever. But, like, A, everybody was at this time. But B, like, why wouldn't they want their daughter to become the queen? That's, like, the ultimate goal. And this is not weird. Like, they would have arranged for her to marry someone. Anyway, like, Jane, who we're going to learn about soon. Uh, Lady Jane Grey had been brought up in a world, in a society, and a class where she knew that her marriage was going to be arranged and that it would be for the good of her family. So she would have expected her parents to do the best for her future by choosing for her a high-status groom. But there's no reason to assume that this would have displeased her, the plan to maybe marry her cousin, Edward. So Jane went to hang out with Princess Elizabeth, who was like similar-ish age, who is Catherine Parr's stepdaughter at this point, at Catherine Parr's house. Um, And that's where Catherine Parr hosted all these salons and had all these religious debates. And uh, Elizabeth was probably like almost definitely assaulted by Thomas Seymour. And it's just kind of a weird time for everybody. And then Catherine Parr died shortly after giving birth to a daughter. Francis and Henry, well, after all this happened, Francis and Henry wrote to Thomas saying, like, so can Jane come back home now? Like, because Catherine Parr just died. And that was allowed. Lady Jane Grey came home for a short time. But Thomas, oh God, okay, he's the worst. Thomas Seymour was like, "Mm, but what if you send her back to me? So I don't know if he wanted to maybe marry her for power or something, but... Jane was only there for a short time before Thomas Seymour was charged and found guilty of treason and was executed. So good riddance to him. After his execution, Jane Grey returned for real to her family and resumed her studies with her tutor. And at this point, the Greys were in high favor with the king, who is the boy king, Edward. So when I say the king, it's kind of like the king slash the Seymour relatives who were his regents. So the Francis and Henry, and I guess maybe Jane and their daughters, moved between their home in London and Bradgate. So they just went to royal court quite a bit, and they were, because they were super important people. They were closely related to him, and he didn't have a lot of alive relatives. We know that in September of 1549, Francis and her husband entertained the king at their house. And then in August 1550... Okay, I'll explain the situation, and then I'll explain the repercussions of it after. So in August 1550, Frances liked hunting. That was one of her hobbies. That's what all the rich people did. It's not weird. That was her hobby. She went off for a hunt, and Jane was left at home alone to study because she really liked studying, and Frances supported that for her. While Jane was at home without her parents there, a man named Roger Asham came by, who was like a writer slash intellectual person. And 20 years later, he would write a book called The Schoolmaster, in which he would recall that Jane had told him that her parents were physically abusive to her. The only evidence or hint at all we have that Frances was abusive to her daughter is this guy, Roger Asham, who wrote a book 20 years later about a conversation he had with Jane. So he may have exaggerated what Jane said. Jane might have been trying to, I don't know, impress him or something or maybe she's mad at her parents but whatever jane allegedly told him all this stuff and 20 years later he wrote in his book but the thing is that his book the schoolmaster kind of the thesis of it was that teachers should not act as parents and resort to corporeal punishment to motivate their students so his whole point was kind of like teachers should be nice because parents are mean 
so he threw in a story here about Jane Grey, who is like famously intelligent, saying like, see, her parents were mean. Teachers should be nice. So it's just... Okay, so during Tudor times, good parents were strict parents and physical punishment was common. So maybe she was whatever. Maybe she was beaten because that's just kind of what people did. Not that that's a good thing, but just it's not uncommon. So the thing is that because of what Roger Ashram wrote in his book, Francis has got this long, like centuries long, horrible reputation of being this cruel abusive woman and we're going to talk about that later but just bear in mind that the only only mention anyone ever said about that was roger asham 20 years later saying jane gray told him this maybe it's true but a lot of people threw in some fake examples that don't actually there's no evidence of them so jane's parents were extremely proud of her they were very ambitious for her Uh, She was stubborn, unusually bright, articulate, and opinionated. And Jane had an Italian tutor named Michel Angelo Florio, who he wrote that Jane seemed particularly close to her mother. There's a man named John of Alm who also visited their house and says the family seemed happy, which doesn't mean that Francis wasn't abusive to Jane. But again, it just, her reputation really blossomed from this one thing so who knows what the real story is but i'm gonna say roger asham misremembered and or made that whole thing up that's my theory so yeah so other than this one record there are no contemporaneous documents saying anything about francis being abusive to her children or her servants or anyone ever so the people who would go on to vilify francis have said that so the fact that Francis gave Jane such a thorough and good education some people say like that shows that they were scheming they were overly ambitious um it was their way of compensating like they didn't have a living son so they tried to overcompensate by like making her do too much school or something some writers depict the, the parents as resenting Jane being so intellectual but this is all I mean wild guesses but also probably untrue it's not giving her a good education doesn't mean that they were any more or less scheming than anybody else who wanted good things for the children and if they were scheming good for them like of course they were she was maybe gonna marry the king like she was a really important young woman and they could see that good things maybe could happen for her and it doesn't make them villains if they tried to encourage that happening henry gray He was a patron of scholars, so he also was really into education and learning. He had a reputation as a man who was proud of his own learning. So, of course, they would have wanted the same thing for their daughter, Jane. And, frankly, if the... So, some people think that maybe the Greys didn't like Jane being so intellectual, but if they had, they would have just stopped paying for her tutors. So, this is... This is the sort of thing where I came across so many references to how... Francis has been misrepresented as this abusive person, but I read those before I read anything suggesting that she was abusive. So it's just kind of like, I'm disproving this theory to you that you might not even know about. But if you watch, for instance, the movie Jane, Lady Jane, starring Helena Bonham Carter, the mother, the Francis character is shown like cruelly hunting and I forget, like vivisecting a deer or something and being horribly abusive. And that's partially because that is a that was just kind of how she was remembered by history for a long time but also because that is a movie and movies need villains and it makes jane the character be more sympathetic if the mother seems mean so that whole piece of it i just wanted to throw out there so i'm just debunking something that may not even have been bunked for any of you francis gray i don't think was any more or less physically abusive than any other mother in this era and the fact that they worked so hard to educate jane kind of shows the opposite well i don't know they could work hard to not the opposite but just clue that she cared for her daughter that's all i'm saying well and also everybody were catty bitches then like if anyone had thought that she was an unusually harsh mother or mean like someone would have written it down and nobody did until 20 years later as part of this guy's thesis about why learning should be taught rather 
than by love than fear. So, in the summer of 1551, there was an outbreak of the sweating sickness, and Francis's two half brothers, Charles and Henry Brandon, died. Which meant because her father was dead, her brothers were dead, there was no male people in the family. So now the title of Duke of Suffolk was available because her oldest brother had that title. So, with no one else around, Francis's husband, Henry Grey, was endowed with the title by right of his wife, and she was now the Duchess of Suffolk. And she, things were still going good. So even though people knew, and she openly supported the reformed religion, she maintained a close relation, friendship with Princess Mary, who her godmother slash longtime person she knew. So Princess Mary was now heir to the throne, and Francis was friends with her. Francis and all three of her daughters visited Mary, actually, in 1549, and they all celebrated Christmas together in 1551. That same year, in 1551, Francis was present during the welcoming ceremonies for Marie de Guise, who was the Dowager Queen of Scots and regent in Scotland for her daughter, Mary Queen of Scots. Marie de Guise is an amazing person. I will 10,000% do a podcast about later. Mary Queen of Scots, I'm going to do some podcasts. Don't you worry about it. But so they were, Mary Queen of Scots is the descendant of Henry's, Henry VIII's sis, older sister, Margaret, who had all been disinherited in favor of Francis and the other heirs of Henry's younger sister, Mary. There's a lot of Marys and Maries. I'm so sorry. But the fact that Francis was present during these welcoming ceremonies shows how high status she had. Then the next year in the summer of 1552, Francis became super sick, deathly ill, probably the sweating sickness. Her family despaired for her life. Her husband, so she was staying at their London home and her husband left Royal Court to be by her side because this family, they do a lot of being with each other when they die. She did recover, but from this point forward, she suffered some from some long lasting symptoms like a constant fever slash shivering and some spleen related issues. And then, but everything is still utter chaos. The fact that the king is a boy means that all these ambitious men around them were making all kinds of schemes and plans. Everybody kind of had to choose a side. And your sides were sort of Edward Seymour, who is the, had been the uncle slash lord protector of the boy king, or there's another guy called John Dudley, who is the Duke of Northumberland. So Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, was removed from being the boy king's advisor, and he was replaced by John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, and Francis and Henry were like, we're just going to support John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland. That seems like what we want to do. John Dudley in the Lady Jane film is played by Patrick Stewart, I'm pretty sure. Just frankly watch the movie. It's, it's a good movie. John Dudley, the father of Robert Dudley, if you know who that is, Queen Elizabeth's longtime paramour, so John Dudley was now the head of the king's council and had massive influence over the king and the country. So Francis and Henry siding with him was just sort of uh, making an informed decision about who, where do they think the power is and who do they want to support and how can they continue having some influence for themselves. Dudley began to work on a plan to bypass the king's sister Mary as his heir. So right now, I know I kept changing, but so Edward is a boy and the king. Until he had his own children, his heir was going to be his older sister, Mary, followed by his next oldest sister, Elizabeth, and then I guess it would be Francis next. But Dudley was like, mm, we don't really want Mary to be queen next because of Catholic reasons, and she, everyone knew if and when she became queen, she would probably make England be Catholic again. So they were trying to find a way to bypass her. Francis does not seem to be have been involved in this particular line of scheming although her husband maybe was. But this is where the Lady Jane Grey scenario, how to lose a queen in nine days stuff, starts kind of coming together. So the boy king's health was in decline. Under the influence of John Dudley, Edward would Edward started working on his own will, which is just like for a little kid king to be writing a will is kind of sad. But they effectively manipulated slash convinced him to write a will excluding... Mary and making his heir be Francis's daughters. So not again, not Francis herself, but Francis's daughters. So this was made into letters patent, signed by the king and his council. 
Uh, there were arguments at the time that changing the succession would require parliamentary ap approval, and that never actually happened. While the letters patent were being done up, Dudley called Francis to to come by so she could swear to give up her claim to the throne in favor of her daughters. So you remember there was a plan before of to maybe marry Lady Jane to the king, but now the king was dying. So it's like, who can be, how's this going to work? And here's what happens. Dudley approached Francis and her husband about marrying their daughter Jane to his son, Guildford Dudley, played in the movie by Carrie Elwes in his Princess Bride era, Young Handsomeness. So that's who you can picture for that. Francis opposed the marriage because she could smell the fact that they were working on some sort of scheme that seemed kind of treasonous, but her husband Henry agreed. And because of patriarchy, that's all it took. So on May 21st, Guildford Dudley was married to Lady Jane Grey. And then, so May 21st, that wedding happened. The king, the boy king, died on July 6th. And then things began to move swiftly. His death was kept, kept secret for three days. And then Jane was proclaimed queen by the Privy Council in front of her parents at one of their homes. The next day, Jane was publicly recognized as queen at Westminster. So this is basically a coup by John Dudley. To, because you know the thing about if a woman is the queen, then her husband gets all the power. So this is a way for John Dudley to get his son, Guildford, to hopefully have all the power. And so Jane becomes the queen. Frances was there with her every step of the way. She was supporting her throughout this whole ordeal. Jane didn't want to be queen. We're going to learn more about her her take on the situation in a future episode. But So Frances and Jane were lodged together in anticipation of her coronation. But Mary, Francis's godmother, was determined to overthrow this and become queen because this is all a bunch of bullshit to her and everyone, really, because the law stipulated that Mary should be the next queen. Like this is Jane Grey became queen sort of because of an asterisk sort of footnote in a document that was never actually legally approved, sort of. Um... So Dudley, John Dudley, and Henry Gray, Francis's husband, were instructed to raise troops to fight Mary, to keep her out, and to keep Jane being the queen. Francis didn't want him to go. She didn't want her husband to do this, because she, again, just she had good survival instincts, I think, from all her time at court. And sure enough, support for Jane melted away, and Mary was proclaimed queen bloodlessly. There was no actual battle. Everyone just kind of gave up and let her take over. And so this was, this all happened in nine days. And then Jane was now a prisoner in the Tower of London. Frances was forced to leave Jane because she'd been with her this whole time. And then, but Henry, Frances's husband, was arrested and imprisoned for his part in the whole Jane Grey scenario. Frances rode to plead the case of her family with the Queen, Mary, her longtime friend slash godmother. She arrived the morning of July 29th and made an impassioned plea for her husband's life to marry. And so the same people who sort of claim that Frances was this horrible, mean bully who didn't love her daughter are like, well, why didn't she make an impassioned plea for her daughter's life? And it's like, well, maybe she did. Like, but no one wrote it down. So she told Mary her family was the victim of John Dudley's schemes, which they were, and threw herself and her husband on the Queen's mercy. Frances probably believed that Mary would be merciful to Jane. So that's maybe another reason why she was pleading for her husband, but maybe not so much for Jane. Mary was sympathetic to Francis. They were longtime friends. Remember, they had spent Christmas together and stuff. And Mary apparently wanted, like she was leaning towards pardoning Jane and Henry, but Mary's counselors, the imperial ambassadors, argued against this. And so the next day, Mary agreed to pardon Henry, but not Jane. Lady Jane Grey was charged with treason for having, we'll talk about why exactly last time, but basically for becoming queen, and she would face execution. Mary released Henry from the tower, but he was to remain under house arrest, but guess what? In January of the next year, Henry Grey left house arrest to go join a man called Thomas Wyatt and other rebels in an uprising to protest Queen Mary's pending marriage to King Philip of Spain. King Philip of Spain being a descendant of Juana from 
Juana of Castile from last season on this podcast. So Henry Gray is just like, gotta go do some more treasoning. So there's evidence Francis did not approve of this plot, did not want Henry to do this, uh, didn't want her husband involved. And again, her instincts were correct because the rebels were defeated and captured, including her husband. So Francis, again, is just like, oh my God, my husband, ugh, she's got to plead again. So she goes to see Mary again, like, hey, it's me, what's up? And she pleaded with the queen not to pardon her husband, but at least to forgive him. She knew that he was probably going to be executed for like literal treason. But the if the queen forgave him, that would allow Francis and her daughters to have some rehabilitation, rehabilitation at court. Um, and maybe she could get some of, when her husband was arrested, all of his lands were confiscated and given to the crown. So Francis was kind of penniless, kind of bankrupt, and her reputation was in tatters. So she was at least just hoping for the forgiveness so her life could improve a little bit. But Mary, at this point, not to ingrate herself personally... We'll do an episode about her later to get into why that was. But for Mary's own reasons, uh, she had Lady Jane Grey and Guilford Dudley tried, found guilty, and executed. Five days later, Henry Grey was put on trial, and then he was executed as well. So now Frances' oldest daughter and son-in-law had been executed. Her husband had been executed. She had still two daughters, Catherine and Mary Grey. But kind of what is she going to do now? there's no record that Francis at this point before Jane was executed had pleaded for her life but there's no reason to believe that she wouldn't have again the haters say like the fact that we don't today have evidence of a farewell letter from Jane to Francis means that Jane was mad at her mother but the letter could have gone missing this was all several hundreds of years ago and Jane's Italian tutor uh, Florio stated that Jane did in fact write to Francis so the letter may have been lost or Francis may have chosen to destroy it anyway two weeks after her husband Henry was executed Francis got married so we talked before with with Catherine Parr about how you're supposed to wait a certain amount of time before getting married and I forget what it is but it's at least six months I feel like it might be a year uh, Francis Gray waited two weeks before taking her new husband, who was a man named Adrian Stokes. He was, this was probably a love match. He was uh, one of her gentleman sort of staff members. He was her master of horse slash steward. He was 36 years old and she was 37. So again, the ages are pretty close. Why would she have gotten married two weeks after her husband was executed to one of her servants is a great question. The haters say it disproves that she was like heartless and didn't care that her daughter had just been killed and her husband had just been killed. But I think it's kind of obvious that she was frantic to find a way to survive and not to try and save face for herself and for her children. So Elizabeth I's biographer, William Camden, who lived around the same time just a bit afterwards believe that Francis made the match to her dishonor but yet for her security as marrying a commoner distanced Francis and her surviving children from the crown making her be suddenly like not a threat at all so hopefully she wouldn't be executed either it was a way to just like neuter herself as a challenge so the law said if a noble woman marries a commoner she ceases to be noble so this marriage compelled Francis to give up her status as duchess But society continued to respect her anyway, and guess what? She wasn't executed, so good plan there. Frances was also, after her husband was executed, she was entrusted with the care of her husband's niece, whose name was Margaret Willoughby, and people commented approvingly at Frances' success at introducing Margaret Willoughby to court, so again, just showing that she's maybe a nice person. Due to Francis's nonstop behind the scenes pleading and begging the case and working all of her connections from back in her house party days, the Gray family was rehabilitated after the death of her husband, even though, even as the imperial ambassadors did their best to continue to persuade Mary to eliminate the Gray family as threats to her being queen. But, au contraire, by July 1554, Mary, Queen Mary invited Francis to join the Privy Chamber. So a super prestigious position for her. And it just kind of showed that Mary is like a no hard feelings gesture. Francis also maintained a friendly relationship with Princess Elizabeth, 
who was at this point Queen Mary's heir. So, like, the Grey family was just, like, mostly out of contention here altogether. Like, marrying Adrian Stokes just really fixed that problem for her. Also, actually, so when her husband had been arrested before she married Adrian Stokes, there had been rumors that maybe Francis would be married to a man named Edward Courtney, who was a descendant of the Plantagenet royal family. He was a man who also had been, he was sort of just like eligible bachelor. So he was a potential husband for Mary and for Elizabeth. But Francis, potentially one of the reasons she married Adrian Stokes so quickly was just so that no one could make her marry Edward Courtney, because then she would have been a huge threat again. So Mary Adrian Stokes is truly a preemptive strike to escape herself being a target anymore. She So she was in Mary's privy chamber, but eventually Francis retired from royal court. She had three pregnancies with her second husband, only one of which resulted in a live birth of a daughter she named Elizabeth, but the baby died after a few months. So Queen Mary died, having had no children, and she was inherited inherited by she was succeeded by her sister who became queen elizabeth I. francis was too ill to attend elizabeth's coronation and actually by early november 1559 francis drew up her will and arranged to sell some property and give the proceeds to her surviving children lady catherine gray and lady mary gray francis named adrian stokes as the executor of her will and left all her goods and life interest in most of her property to him so francis gray Frances Brandon Gray Stokes died on November 21st with her two daughters at her side, as well as some close friends as well. Like this is, I don't, I like this custom of having people there with you. It just shows the love of a family. Queen Elizabeth agreed to pay for the funeral because Frances was technically her cousin. Elizabeth called her her beloved cousin. Frances's funeral was the first Protestant service in Westminster Abbey after the reconstitution of its chapter by Queen Elizabeth I, because when Mary was queen, she made it be Catholic, but then Elizabeth made it be Protestant again. So Frances was only 42 when she died. But if you go by, like, major traumatizing life event per year, you would think she was 85. So at her funeral, her daughter, Lady Catherine Gray, acted as chief mourner, the same role that Frances had played at her own mother's funeral. Four years later... Adrian Stokes erected a monument to Francis in Westminster Abbey, which still exists today. You can go visit it if you're there. The monument contains inscriptions in English and Latin, the first of which reads, Here lieth the Lady Frances, Duchess of Suffolk, daughter to Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, and Marie, the French Queen, first wife to Henry, Duke of Suffolk, and after to Hadrian Stock, Esquire. The fact that this inscription does not mention Francis's daughters is, again, these conspiracy theory haters say, like, oh, this is proof that she wasn't a good mother, that the daughter's names aren't mentioned here. But actually, so at the time she died, well, four years after she died, by this point, spoiler for some later episodes this season, at the time this monument went up, Francis's oldest surviving daughter, Catherine Gray, was currently uh, a prisoner in the Tower of London, and Adrian Stokes had been one of the people questioned about the stuff that Catherine did that got her sent to jail. Catherine Gray's place in the royal succession was also a very delicate subject. Elizabeth was kind of panicked by the presence of the Gray family, so it seems like probably a conscious decision by Adrian Stokes to not mention the daughters on the tomb. So he wasn't being disrespectful, but actually kind of smart about it. So why did she get such a bad reputation? So Leanna Delisle, who wrote a book about the Grey sisters, she noted that Lady Jane Grey's reputation as a helpless, meek victim developed over the centuries. Like, if you look at some of the famous art paintings of Lady Jane Grey, she just seems like this poor, stranded little baby who doesn't, who can't help herself. So Frances's reputation devolved in parallel fashion. To quote Leanna Delisle, from the early 18th century, Frances became the archetype of female wickedness. And the writer Susan Higginbottom, Higginbotham, who's written a novel about Frances, says that, here's a quote from her, Susan Higginbotham, but there is another reason why Frances has become such a loathed figure, at least among women, and that is Jane herself. Jane, 
the girl who preferred reading a book to hunting with a family is the thinking girl's heroine. She's the sort of girl who hated gym class, who hated going to family gatherings and having to make small talk with her dreary relations, who spent her lunch hour hiding out in the library. She's the sort of girl who grows into a reader and often into a writer. When female readers and authors come across Jane's complaint to Roger Ashim, they do not picture just Jane, but themselves. In that situation, poor Francis doesn't stand a chance. So that is the story of Francis Gray, the Duchess of Suffolk, and it's time to score her on our Scandalicious scale. So here we go. And this is an interesting, there's always some weird thing that makes this scoring interesting or complicated. And here it's the fact that there is all this scandal around her name for being this horrible, abusive mother, but it's mostly unfounded. And also I hadn't heard of it so it doesn't really affect my the way that I see her so the first category is scandaliciousness so she her proximity to scandaliciousness like she's the mother of Lady Jane Grey who kind of usurped the throne her husband was executed in in this failed rebellion like she was this is where I think she was really clever and really resilient that she was able to work so hard despite all these scandals being around her that she herself while she was alive was not really tainted by the scandaliciousness of it all. Although marrying her like horse groomer two weeks after her husband was executed is like pretty high up for scandaliciousness. I'm going to give her a seven, I think. Scheminess. And this is just her, so her husband's scheminess is like shitty bad poorly done scheminess where he got caught and then executed her scheminess I would say stuff like going to the queen like convincing her to free her husband like all this behind the scenes stuff she did to even marrying Adrian Stokes like she was smart she had a plan and she did everything she could to try and just to survive in this wild world in which she was living I'm gonna give her an eight I think for scheminess significance as per ever this season is an interesting question. She's the mother of Lady Jane Grey, and Lady Jane Grey is a pretty significant figure. Also, just being the daughter of of the French Queen and her own personal significance, though, I think. It's not major. Like, she was there while a lot of stuff happened. And she did all this scheming. You know, I'm going to give her a nine for scheming to kind of make up for the fact that for significance I'm giving her I'm giving her a six no yeah six because she's the mother of Lady Jane Grey and then for sexism bonus there's not a lot in her story that's like there's the regular shitty amount of patriarchal bullshit that everybody goes through but there's nothing that's like especially galling on top of that so I think I'm just going to stick with the standard Default five five point sexism bonus. So that gives her sixteen. Twenty seven. Everybody this season is getting really close to each other. So twenty seven is the same as Catherine Parr. Uh point five less than her mother, Mary Tudor. This season I like how this is sort of lining up. Everybody this season is like quite consistent. They're ranging from twenty five to twenty seven point five thus far on scandal to scale. So that is Francis Gray. This is the Vulgar History Podcast. My name is Ann Foster. So you can follow us on Instagram at Vulgar History Pod, Twitter at Vulgar History. I have a website where I write essays about historical women. That's at annfosterwriter.com. I have a Patreon, which is at patreon.com slash annfosterwriter. There's a merch store where we're selling stuff themed to some women from previous seasons as well as to to this season's overall well the women this season and just kind of the overall themes like there's a shirt for the renaissance reformation girl squad for instance and some other just cool things face masks all the stuff from the patreon and from the store just by the way goes to help support my writing and this podcast and that's what it's for so i appreciate the support i don't have any ads on this podcast because partially i can't be bothered and partially I'd rather just fund it through supporters, you know, like public television. That just feels right for me for right now. And what else is there? So yes, the patreon.com and foster writer. 
And then the Teespring store, the link is in the show notes, but it's at teespring.com slash stores slash vulgar history. And also if you go on bookshop.org, I have a list of the recommended books, like books that I've used for research and reference. And I just realized I forgot to tell you what I used to research today's episode. So the books I will recommend for this. So this is a book that's been really helpful to me for many of these kind of less lesser known women this season. So there's a book called Elizabeth's Women, Friends, Rivals, and Foes Who Shape the Virgin Queen by Tracy Borman. Recommend. There's a book, Henry VIII, The King and His Court by Alison Weir. The Sisters Who Would Be Queen, Mary Catherine and Lady J. Grey, A Tudor Tragedy by Leanna Delisle. Super good. And then also Crown of Blood, The Deadly Inheritance of Lady Jane Grey by Nicola Tellis. There's no books about just Frances, but she pops up and that's where I put everything together. And then there's also a really great essay so Susan Higginbotham wrote a really good essay on her. She is a historical fiction writer, and she also keeps a blog where she talks about various stuff. And she wrote an essay called The Maligned Frances Grey, Duchess of Suffolk. And she wrote a book, a historical fiction book, called Her Highness the Traitor, which is why she wrote why she did so much research on Francis, and also why she wrote this great essay about it. So Susan Higginbotham, I'll put a link to her book as well in the bookshop.org link that you can get to through the show notes. But as ever, this is Vulgar History. My name is Anne Foster, and keep your masks on and your tits out, and I'll talk to you next time. Welcome to the small town of Chinook, where faith runs deep and secrets run deeper. In this new thriller, religion and crime collide when a gruesome murder rocks the isolated Montana community. Everyone is quick to point their fingers at a drug-addicted teenager, but local deputy Ruth Vogel isn't convinced. She suspects connections to a powerful religious group. Enter federal agent V.B. Loro, who has been investigating a local church for possible criminal activity. The pair form an unlikely partnership to catch the killer, unearthing secrets that leave Ruth torn between her duty to the law, her religious convictions, and her very own family. But something more sinister than murder is afoot, and someone is watching Ruth. Chinook, starring Kelly Marie Tran and Sanaa Lathan. Listen to Chinook wherever you get your podcasts. Ah, the web tool. Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's that, Jimmy? This is how you deal with me! No! Do not <laughs> harm my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to. Do you know what lies within nothing? Rocket is in trouble, a castle. Can, can we turn on the windshield remotely? No! She could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar. No, but you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! I don't like free-falling! Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I'm the host and creator of Only One in the Room podcast. Every week, my co host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's incredible Only One story. We talk to the realest of real people dealing with issues like infertility, addiction, human trafficking, and body shaming. Oh, and we want to be fair, so we talk to some celebrities too. Oscar winners, New York Times bestselling authors, supermodels, and even the most decorated U.S. Winter Olympian. Everyone is invited to share their only one story with our listeners. This podcast is for anyone who has ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. Download Only One in the Room wherever you listen to podcasts today.